Uh, this chapter is about evaluating regression models and using uh, after we have built a regression model with uh, a Bayesian regression model. So uh, our learning objectives are determining whether a model is fair, uh, determining how wrong a model could, could be, or determine our models posterior predict predictive accuracy. Okay. So there's, um, to begin with, there's uh, some more questions to ask. So basically we should uh, uh, do some more investigations when we check if it's a model is okay or not, as if it requires some modifications. So when we look at the Bayesian models results, we might, it might be important to investigate a bit more about how was the data collected, by whom and for what purpose was the data collected, how might the results of the analysis or the data collection itself impact individuals and society, what bias biases uh, might be baked into this analysis. So there may be uh, more than one, there may, more than one reason for which we do a Bayesian um, analysis. Um, like, I don't know, we want to forecast some, some values or so we want to identify some characteristics that we can extrapolate from the model. So th this is from the uh, go, uh, dcgo.com. Uh, bike friendly Washington DC. So that that's uh, some statistics. So I think that there's many uses for, for this data and they turns out to be very interesting when we compare them with temperature, for example, as in this case. So uh, the, mm, we, the, the previous chapter, we have seen that uh, making a, a Bayesian regression model uh, we uh, need to verify, have some assumptions verified. So this, uh, the first, the, these three assumptions are uh, related to the structure of the data and so independency. Uh, independency is a very important um, assumption that we, it should be uh, very well verified. Otherwise it can be assumed so it can be done as a accepted, just as a, an assumption. Um, then there's a assumption two, which is related to the structure of the relationship. So the relationship is linear, is not linear. So we as, assume that it is linear. And so we verify linearity within the, um, the response and the predictor that we use. Then the, the third assumption is related with the structure of the variability and so the cons consistency of the model. In this case, we have chosen a normal model. So and the normality assumption should be verified. So our model case uh, is made of, uh, uh, so the number of capital bike share rides and this is our response variable, the temperature on a, a particular day, and this is our predictor. So we basically like to understand how the number of rides changes within temperature or how the temperature, how the temperature influence the number of rides. Mm -hmm. um, so we started from uh, a simple regression model, this one here. And then obviously we advertise that uh, our response variable will approximate very well. Uh, so the, the, the mean value of an uh, hypothetical uh, new amount of data. Okay, so an average value potential uh, forecasted average value. So our, uh, th this mean value will be our new outcome, uh, okay? So that would be what we obtain after we've done the model, okay? And uh, so this is our, our model. 
to just to recap a bit, to turn this into a Bayesian model, we must incorporate prior models for each of the unknown regression parameters. This is refers to this part of the book. Um, so as we have seen last week, uh, basically we assign parameters to our intercept uh, and our uh, other estimation co coefficients, okay? We, uh, we have a sigma, so we have a beta zero, beta one, the sigma, and we hypothesize that the residuals, okay, uh, behave normally. So they follow a normal distribution with mu and sigma and, and variance sigma quadro. And uh, so this is uh, the, our starting point. Then Oliver said about how to calculate the values of the, those parameters after having uh, make some reasoning about you know the average temperature and decided which one was the the range to work um, with and then to so based on this um, assumption we have built this um, Bayesian model so we expect some good results. And so we consider 500 daily observation within two year periods. If, there, if you want to jump in, interrupt, ask questions, uh, uh, please do it. So the response variable is the ridership Y uh, and it's likely to be correlated. So we are now going through the first to verify if this model um, uh, it's good for, um, it's meeting the three assumptions. So our response variable ridership Y is likely to be correlated over time with other features as well as temperature. So we are now one to the assumption one is independency. Uh, okay, so um, we, we might say, okay, uh, as, as said in the book, today's ridership is likely to tell us something about tomorrow's ridership. So yet much of this correlation or dependence can be explained by the time of the year. So it will be influenced by the temperature. Okay, so are they independent or independent or not? So, and those features that are uh, as well associated with the time of the year, okay. So, and then again, knowing the temperature on two subsequent days might very well cancel out the time correlation in the ridership data. So they, they said, okay, they, they are correlated. Okay, so the number of rides are related to the level of temperature, but one day, a temperature in one day is uncorrelated with the temperature in another day. So in some senses, they are independent. So the verification of one is in the, of, of something that happened in one day is completely independent of about something that happened in the following day, in the subsequent day. So we are tempted, tempted to conclude the temperature in one location are independent to those in neighborhood locations. And the temperature in one month don't tell us about the next. So finally, we conclude that the assumption one independence for us is verified. So basically we say, yes, that there is independence within one day and another. So we can say that it's reasonable to assume that in light of the temperature X, that ridership data Y is independent from day to day. It's not independent from temperature, but it's independent from day to day. So the first assumption is done. So it's verified. So we, we convinced, convinced ourselves that we can go forward looking for the other two assumptions and see if they, they verify. So um, our model is this. So these are the parameters and these are the, the values that Oliver explained last week, how to calculate them and why it's 5,000, why it's, so I won't go uh, through that again. Yeah. 
these are the data. So I've just selected the, the vectors that we need. So we have the date, the right, and the temperature field. To evaluate if assumption two, assumption three are verified, we can conduct a posterior predictive check. Okay. So our first look was at the relationship between rides and temperature. So, and so at the consistency of the distributions. The assumption two is an assumption related to linearity, and the assumption three is related to normality. So if, if we do a quick plot, as we have seen even last week, you know, the tendency is linear. So we say, yeah, uh, linearity is it's met. So given the combined model assumption reasonable, the posterior model should be able to simulate the ridership data very close to the original 5,000 rides observation. Okay. Yeah. This is the model with Stan GLM that uh, has been made. Okay, so we seen that we have seen that. I think it was in an earlier chapter, wasn't it? I had to go back and find it. Chapter, it's, it's... Uh, chapter nine. Chapter nine. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I tell. Uh, I, um, so this is chapter nine, and um, so this uh, there's some specification. Uh, uh, about the numbers and uh, then some other uh, explanation and then there is the there you go yeah so this is in uh, 931 going back to what so this is our model okay so now we transform that to us to be a data frame because so is manageable so we see the result, uh, for example, for the first uh, line, we have an intercept, the temperature field, and the, uh, the sigma, okay? Because any questions? So this is our um, response variable, okay? This is the intercept, and this is the standard deviation, okay? So now what we are going to do is, is we are going to simulate to verify normality assumption, we are going to simulate more data from these uh, uh, average values. Okay, so we take uh, this uh, data frame and uh, uh, select uh, uh, the first row and take this as elements for building up our uh, random normal distribution. Okay, so this is one simulation called uh, new data. So we can see that now we have rides and simulated rides, which they seems apparently to the beginner a bit different, but then on average, they quite meeting um, uh, the, the, the original data. So if we do a plot and see uh, this one simulation data, uh, and we simulate the, the rides from the R norm, and so the simulated rides and the rides with the density, we can see that they, uh, you know, um, the, the light blue, which is the posterior simulated data set of ridership, doesn't catch the both peaks. But uh, basically, it's capable of uh, replicating the, the overall trend. Okay, so it's able to replicate the overall trend. So we can see that is going this way. The, 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 the most important peak is this. So um, the normality assumptions, uh, we, we, we say that it's met. 
Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty. It's, it's a pretty good simulation. In in the real world, I don't think it's necessarily uh, would necessarily be that good. But I think it's probably quite a good book, book example to show yeah. what, what it should be like. Okay, so now we do. We need we need to do one more check, and this is on uh, a larger uh, number of simulations. So we do a posterior predictive check using this function, PP check. This is um, the function that should be used. It's from base plot package, including even in RSNAM, RSNAM. Um, so this one here, if we do PP uh, check, on the bike model, this is the bike, the GLM Sanam Stan model, this one here. So the bike model. So if we do the PP check on the bike model and we hypothesize a certain number of replications without nothing else, because if you have a look with the question mark at the function, it says many things. You 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 can use the Y replication, or in this case we use just an N reps. Okay, so the number of replications. So as you can see, all the replications are around the, the, the ISP. So it's a quiet. Um, so in general. We say that uh, the, the normality assumption is met. So the, the, it, the model is consistent. Okay, so in general, um, to check the last two assumptions, we should assume different data structure and then make some transformation in case. Like we can do, if we are not satisfied with using this PP check, uh, we can uh, do differently, like make like features with um, using log transformation, for example, on the data and see how they behave, if changes or not. But in, in this case, we don't need it because it's, it's a good example. So it behaves well and the normalized assumption is met. Yeah. Okay, so now we 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 like to uh, like reassume, have a, a summary of the result, and conclude and say um, with some numbers that this plot uh, um, has made like the point that we want. So it's good. We can use it, etc. So how accurate are the posterior predictive models? All, all, all these things that we have made here. Okay. Now the question is, how accurate are the posterior predictive models? So there are three approaches to evaluating predictive quality. Uh, this is a bit tricky in the chapter because, um, but um, this is my understanding. So we have a posterior predictive summary that we can use. And uh, with this function, the prediction summary, and uh, on the bike model, so in the model, from, from the model, so we can extrapolate the median absolute error, the scaled median absolute error, and the range within uh, 50 and 95 per, uh, percentiles. So it releases a, a little nice table with all the information that we want. Okay. It's a um, average, which is um, for yeah, now, the, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the standard deviations, isn't it? I think uh, the scaled one, if I remember rightly. Yeah. yeah. The, there's, there's, there should be a percentage. Because it's scaled, so centered and scaled means uh, uh, it's not 
uh, is the the mean mi minus the the standard the so is yeah so it's scaled so it's centered the scaled so this should be uh, seventy five percent but I'm not sure about that so uh, let let's go forward mm -hmm. it will tell more uh, tell more okay now um let let's be a bit more precise okay if we go on uh, our chapter and uh, so this is what uh, we have seen now uh, Okay, because I've put this on top and then the others, because the, the posterior, uh, where is it? The prediction summary is the most useful, uh, used one. So then you can do cross validation, you do other, other checks. But first things you do, you do prediction summary. Okay, so it says that the median, median absolute error measures the typical difference between the observed um, y and the posterior predictive uh, means so the difference it's it's like the the residuals no you know you you part of, you start from the observed values and then uh, see what is the mean di median difference in absolute value um, with the with the, the value that you found. While the scaled median absolute error measures the typical number of standard deviations that the observed Y fall from the posterior predictive means. Yeah, okay. Um, it's not, um, it's centered. So this is the standard deviation. So, you you do the difference between the observed and the, the estimated value, which is about a mean, no? It's something like a mean. And then you divide it by the standard deviation. So this is uh, the scale. Even the scale function in R does this thing. Doesn't do the median, maybe does the mean, or just does this calculation. But centering means the difference between uh, like the value and its mean divided by the standard deviation. So I don't know why I said the typical number of standard deviation because it's the number of standard deviations. It's the number of standard yeah. deviations. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then within uh, within within uh, you know uh, is the different percentiles. Now, as I said, this is the the things that you do. Okay, you have checked the assumption and everything. Then you want to check the uh, the error that your 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 posterior predictive uh, model uh, uh, um, have made models have made. So you do the prediction summary. Then um, you might want to also check with against with other scenarios. And uh, if we do a quick plot of the posterior on a specific uh, uh, 75 degree day, for example, the actual y will be this value here. So 6,228, so this level here. So you see that this is not that bad because 75 is about, you know, it's not it's an average, it's not an average. So that, that would be good. If, if in the book it shows a, a different scenario where you can, uh, uh, like, this is our model, this is an alternative model. So you can uh, check your model against a, dif a different scenario. Okay. And even uh, ask a question if our uh, Bayesian model is good and uh, the, the answer is it's, it's correct. And this, I, I think this is because there is not such a high peak here. So it's like 
Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, basically, um, it, it, it's it's sort of right there. It's not that accurate, but the alternative model is nowhere near it, is it? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, so now, um, if we uh, like to see the prediction, okay, we can calculate the posterior predict, the prediction with posterior predict function on the model. Uh, we use new data bikes, so our data just to um, uh, okay, yeah. And um, with this uh, uh, with this prediction, we can use this function, which is PPC intervals. And this as well is a, a nice visualization released by this uh, this function. And plus, uh, um, uh, basically, the posterior predictive medians that are in light blue dots. Okay, you cannot see it, uh, very well because they're quite crowded, but um, it shows 50% prediction intervals. And in the book is uh, like slightly clearer because they did the same thing on uh, just on uh, 25 days. So this is, uh, these are the same um data same plots and everything so just the the data set has been like short uh, made a bit shorter uh, um, on 25 days so uh, here you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, the the values are around uh, the, the main trend basically the median the, the main median trend so you can like conclude that that would be that would be. And so at the beginning I said there are three approaches to evaluate this predictive quality. One is this prediction summary, and you check the va the values. Okay. Another one is uh, cross validation. So you are not satisfied with the summary. So then um, you might want to uh, uh, proceed with uh, uh, a cross validation. You can do a prediction summary cross validation in the model, with the model, bikes, and you choose the number of case, number of folds that you like to, to be uh, done, yeah? So to see how well our model generalized to new data beyond our new original example, we can estimate these properties using cross-validation techniques. Okay, this is something that you you not might not require to do, but uh, if you're not satisfied, if if you think that your model is not need to be more investigated, you can you can do that. Okay? Like you have, I don't know, few data. Okay, so this, this um, cross-validation procedure, uh, um, this, the result of this function is quite uh, important. So that, that there are some, some, some quite some information inside. So you can have a look at the folds, for example, and inside you again find the uh, median absolute error, the scale and within, but now, uh, you know, they are replicated. So you have more. You can have a, a cross validation itself, the CV uh, part of the, the thing, and you, you find um, the median of these values. Um, so, but at the end of the story, what we want is to find, to, to meet this situation, the scenario one. So we like to find an estimate which is very close to the real mean of our data, okay? And um, there is again one more um, uh, tool that can be used. 
the expected log predictive density, so the LPD, the ELPD, and this uh, measure the average uh, log posterior predictive um, PDF across all possible new data points. So the higher is the uh, ELPD, the better. So how do we do that? Uh, we use the loop function. So we basically use the leave one out cross validation. Um, so we use the loop uh, function on the model and then extrapolate the estimate. So we see that the ELPD is this value here. So we have an estimate which is uh, negative. And uh, it says that uh, the higher is the better. Higher ELPDs indicate greater posterior predictive accuracy when using our model to predict new data points. So I'm not sure about that. Yeah, it, it was very confusing in the text because it said uh, something along the lines of, uh, I know it's minus 4,000, but that might not be bad. Um, it, I think um, it's better for comparing different models against each other rather than the absolute number. I think that was the point that they were trying to make. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that would be uh, um, to be maybe uh, have a, a bit more. Um, there are nice um, uh, exercises um, at the end of the chapter. That would be very nice to to do, uh, you know, I, I hadn't much time, so I started one uh, with the chocolate uh, things, and uh, that, was, that, was, that was nice. But I, I, I even thought to, to, you know, to talk about that as well, but I, I need more time. Maybe next time, or if we do like a case study, some, some, somehow at the end of the book club, we can talk about that. So, but what does it, this mean? Okay, so this is the result. So the, the higher, the better. There is no general scale by which to interpret this uh, positive or negative value. So this might be good in some setting and bad under other um, conditions. So what's the point? So it's tough to interpret the assessment of predictive accuracy for any one particular model of ridership. So uh, we uh, end up with unsatisfying conclusions, basically. And so what do we do? Uh, we can uh, improve this accuracy, how collect, uh, like collecting more data, or changing predictors, okay? Changing the model okay. somehow. So finally, more, more questions to ask to verify if our uh, simulation are good against our model. So we, there's two main questions. How well our uh, simulation approximates the model? And uh, does the model fit? So are the assumptions reasonable? Is the model fair? Does it produce good, good predictions? So the, the D chapter mentions a few things about what is uh, mean, meant about model fair and what is a good prediction. But at the end, the numbers are those that count. Here, there's a nice uh, study. Uh, found within searching the impact of weather condition and capital bike share trips. I don't know if you want, if you like to uh, improve this uh, argument. There's a few more things to, to see. So uh, I have done with the chapter. 
one more thing that I'd like to uh, share with you is the, uh, besides the conclusion um, that we have, you know, um, said that it depends by when, when you work on a model and you look at the data. So it's your model, you know, you're working on it and decided if it, that, if, how, how can you, can we change it basically if you need different predictors and it. Between these uh, exercises, there is one which is very like within these applied exercises, the coffee ratings. I look at that and that, that is very, very interesting. Um, so you can load the data, uh, are in bias rules, um, package, and then you can um, see, uh, I've done a bit, but then you, I needed more time because you need to like uh, set the assumptions as we had um, done in the previous chapter. So we had beta zero, uh, beta one. So the, 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 we have transformed our regression model into a Bayesian regression model, passing, setting a normal distribution with some parameters. So the, the mean and the, 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 uh, the variance. So now you need to look at the data and decide which one is uh, the best for, for your model. So to build up a Bayesian model. So you need, like it says something, but you know. But that's interesting. And it, it guides you through, through the things. So uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, Federica. <laughs> I, I like that chapter. Yeah. Um, I think I'm. I think I'm doing next week. I think we're going to Australia. <laughs> uh, yeah. I. Th I th um. I. I th Lisa was looking that way in the data, but yeah. I. Th I think you got a good chapter there. Okay. Any oh, questions? Great. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I guess one question I have is. I feel like for the posterior predictive checks, are there any other metrics that people know of? Because I know they mentioned the log um, or the ELPD, um, but there must be other metrics to assess um, the accuracy of your model um, within a Bayesian context. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, um, we go back to uh the chapter here uh it mentions um three uh most important um, um summaries let's say okay um to identify because you are now dealing with a certain number of simulations and with probabilities so you might reduce the, the problem to uh, consider the, the classical metrics that you use in case of um, a regression problem. But um, you, you need to consider that you are using probabilities. So now the median, for example, it's a better measure than the mean. And um, um, uh, yeah. I think out, I think out there in the real world of research, a lot of people will still be publishing papers with R squared on, you know, because they're still using normal regression, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was just thinking, like outside of the Bayesian context, there's a mean squared error in addition to median absolute error, so. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if these are like the canonical ones you see in Bayesian papers that they report these ones usually, um, or there. I just know there are a host of other metrics, but um, yeah. At the end of the chapter, 
when it said conclusion uh, here, basically, we assume the briefly we assume the, the what you should do to check no, about the model that you done. So you do the summary, you do the PP check, so it replicates a certain number of uh, density distribution. So you see against your, your data, if that would be uh, catching the trend, basically, the peak maybe. And then uh, there is the accuracy and the posterior predictive summaries. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. Cool, well, I think um, we've sort of finished, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's me next week, I think. So uh, yeah, um, uh, I'll be doing the next chapter this week. I'm mostly off work. This, I think I'm going in for one day on Monday. But um, yeah, I haven't got excuses for not doing it, basically. So yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll see you next Thursday. Take care, guys. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.